Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Rolling Nomads. I am the Azure Butterfly, or Azure for short, or simply Rachel. Uh, I am the creative director here on the Rolling Nomads. I also have my Azure storytelling studio happening every Thursday. Look forward to that tomorrow. We're going to be playing more. We're going to be starting Fallout 4 today. We have a fun little thing going on. We are going to be doing a little bit of a uh, character creation for a fun IP, uh, fun uh, fun game that we just uh, came across called Curseborn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And joining me on and on this adventure and going to be leading this character creation for an actual play that's going to be uh, happening for this is D. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Dee over at from Onyx Path Publishing, and um, I'm putting together a play group to try out this Curseborn game that we've kind of all been hearing about. So um, we've been making characters for the past couple of weeks with uh, different streaming partners, and Rachel, you are the last one. You are the ultimate ending final finishing move whatever <laughs> i don't know i love that also like as somebody who has a last name that starts with a w yeah. um i'm always used, used to, to going it. last yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes thank you for joining us on this and thank you for putting this together it's very exciting very exciting yeah. so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh this whole thing this whole thing yeah so um i, I mean there's not a whole lot to say um we're going to be making a character for Curseborn. Um, I know that you guys had been getting kind of some weird like emails and stuff. Mm -hmm. I found this document on my computer a couple of like months ago. I talked about it on the Pathcast. Um, I've been through it and we decided, you know what, we might as well give it a playthrough. It's using our system and, you know, it looks kind of interesting. So you're kind of here to be our guinea pigs. Uh, I'm here for it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, we're going to, you know, honestly, we're going to jump right into character creation. Um, it, character creation for Straight Path Ultra is pretty simple. Um, I know that the very first step is kind of the hardest step for a lot of people, which is to decide on a concept. Um, if you have an idea for what kind of character you would like to play, um, in what I would describe as urban fantasy horror. From everything that we've seen, I can I can definitely see that. That, that yeah. feels really right for a proper genre. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you have a concept, great. If not, you know, we can kind of settle a concept one, as we go through the character creation. Like, that's mm -hmm. also fine. Yeah. Um, so if you have an idea, great. If not, I'll move on. I will be 100% perfectly honest. The concept is usually the thing that I do like midway to last whenever totally. I make characters. Totally fine. A hundred percent. I totally like, let me look at all of options. And as I'm, as I'm going through and picking the options, then I'm like, ah, concept is coming together. So I'm in the same way. Totally. All right. So the very first step after your concept, which, you know, doesn't have to be the first concept. Um, it doesn't have to be the first step, but um, it, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to pick a lineage path. And then the first, uh, normally you would pick between all of the lineages, but we are trying to make sure that every lineage gets uh, highlighted in this actual play. So you have been assigned a lineage um, you are going to be making a character in the sorcerer lineage. Perfect. I am completely okay with that. Let me go cool. ahead and write that in. So uh, you get some, so your lineage path, you get some path abilities, and this is all in the sorcerer booklet that I sent you. Um, so if you go to the sorcerer systems part, it talks about like what kind of things a sorcerer can do. And if the name sorcerer doesn't, evoke like magician spellcaster then i'm i don't know i don't know what else could um sorcerers are just that they're spellcasters they are people who are just like everyone else except they have been cursed to be 
ruled by magic. And that sounds kind of like a weird curse, but the more I talk about how their cursed works and how they work, it may make a little more sense to you as we go through. So I'm going to go through the different rules of playing a sorcerer. And there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, I'm going to go through the special rules that you have as a sorcerer. Every lineage has their own special rules. They have a damnation, which is the the way the curse manifests. And they have torments, which are like narrative things that you can do and uh, that will let you gain momentum. But they're usually like an, a role play burden is what I've been calling them because they're like a, now you've got to kind of role play something that's maybe inconvenient and that will give you momentum. So, so the first thing that, uh, we're going to talk about is sacrificing. A sorcerer's powers work on sacrifice. They must sacrifice something to get power. And so at any time, you can choose to perform a ritual act of sacrifice to earn curse dice. And curse dice are the fuel of how you would do your spells. And they're, they're, uh, there's a whole system, and I will explain them kind of as we go through. But to get new ones, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it, but sorcerers have this very specific one, which is that they can perform a ritual sacrifice. That sacrifice can be anything that has some kind of meaning to the character. It doesn't have to be material. It could be sacrificing your time, your wealth, your bond of friendship, your well-being, energy, and of course, a physical item. The, the main requirement is that it takes a scene. If okay. there is a way... Uh, the ritual can be elaborate. It can be sparse. It could be, you know, it could be really simple. It doesn't have to be, you know, go out in the woods and draw a circle and praise the moon. Or it doesn't have to be all that. It can be very simple. Um, but if you find a way to include include the rest of your crew, you'll when you do this, you'll add a momentum. So if you get the rest of your group to to help you with your ritual, it'll generate a momentum. Okay, and momentums they work very similar to. Yeah, you use them to re, you know, uh, you use them to add enhancement to rolls. You use them to make a failed roll successful. You can use them to get uh, evidence in an investigation. You can all, all those kinds of things. Um, you can spend momentum for. Okay, so you were gonna about to say something. Oh, I was just gonna say I actually really like the concept of that um, in the sacrificing and that it. It, it can be, it can be, you, you said it can, be, it can be concepts too, as yep. long as that has some importance, some yes. um, connection with it, the uh, wielder. Yes. And once I get into the families, you'll kind of see that the families have, uh, the sorcerer families aren't legit, like not all of them are actual blood relations. In fact, only one of them is a, like, I think a traditional, like actual blood blood relatives or intermarried relatives the rest of them are all we call ourselves a family because that's what the other lineages call their groups but we group together based on what we teach each other and how we view sacrifices so there's going to be a lot of explaining that kind of sacrifice throughout when we talk about the families um the next thing that the next thing that you can do is you can fast cast. So normally when you run out of curse dice because you've been bleeding them to cast things or to do things, your damnation hits. That's just a thing that happens. <laughs> uh, and usually that means because you have no curse dice, you cannot do your magic anymore. Sorcerers can always cast magic even if they don't have any curse dice. Oh, dang. If you cast a spell that requires you to have them, which is literally all of them, and you cannot or do not wish to meet the requirements, and this is important because you could hold cursed dice, or you could not hold enough cursed dice, or you could need to bleed cursed dice and decide you don't want to, you can fast cast the spell. When you do... You suffer a moderate complication on the action. Even if the action doesn't normally take a role, 
you roll against difficulty one with this moderate complication. Failure to buy off the complication results in the spell going awry. Something bad happens. You either take damage, you suffer an appropriate status effect, an ally in the scene takes damage, or the spell will target a new person or do something different at story guide's discretion. Sounds very wild magic-y. Yes. If you do it a second time in the same scene, that complication becomes major. You can also cast spells you don't know, like you you haven't spent XP on them, but you've seen them in the same scene. You can essentially cast those as a fast cast, but you have to bleed a cursed die to do it. So what all is- the rules... All the rules about fast casting still apply as far as the complication. And the way that cursed die works so that you understand is mm-hmm. you're going to start with a cursed die and you'll get them through actions you take. If you want to, you know, do these ritual sacrifices or whatever, every cursed die you have is literally a die that starts the base of your dice pool. So anytime you want to take an action, you start building your dice pool you always start by adding cursed dice and then fill in with normal dice. So if your dice pool, it it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're casting a spell or just like doing something really mundane, like parking your car, you know, you're parking your car, it's pilot plus dexterity. Say that's a five. You have two cursed dice. You start with those two cursed dice and then you pull in three more normal dice to build your dice pool of five. Okay. Um, if you roll successes on those, like hits on those cursed dice, you can uh, buy tricks, specific curse tricks with them. And if you fail the roll and there are cursed dice in your pool, it is what we call a, uh, a dis- like, ah, I forget. It's, I have a word for it. Hold on. Because it's wicked success and something... A cruel failure. Cruel, that is what it's called. So a wicked success is if you roll, if you roll and any of your cursed dice have hits on them. So if you succeed on the roll, or you, you, your action succeeds and any of your cursed dice showed hits, you get a wicked success. And it's always narrative, right? Okay. It is a it is success that is more than you asked for. So here's some examples. An enemy or rival takes note of your success and becomes jealous. Oh. Your family's elders are pleased by your triumph. Your sex success draws the attention of other accursed. Things like that. Uh, a cruel failure is also a narrative burden. Um, in Instead, a uh, cruel failure is if you fail... And none of your cursed dice are hits. So you can sometimes fail and still have hits because the difficulty was higher than you have hits to overcome. But if you fail and none of them are hits, then then you get this a, a bad narrative effect instead. So an enemy or rival takes note of your failure and gloats. Uh, or it, it causes their your your power use causes some trouble. Or somebody is displeased with you, that kind of thing. So anytime you want to cast a spell, you either the spell is either triggered just as an action and you have to be holding. And by holding, it means have available to form a dice pool with a certain number of cursed dice. At, at low level, it's usually one or two. Or you bleed a cursed die, which is you take the cursed die out of your pool, out of your availability, and send it off into the nether realm. So if you ever get down to, I don't, I bled them all out and I don't have any more available to, as, you know, to then be creating my dice pools with, that it that will trigger a damnation. And I will explain the damnation in a little bit. Um, but that is where y- you can still cast fast cast. While that's going on, you're just going to be taking this complication every time you do it. Heard. Right. That's really fascinating. If you see somebody else cast something that you don't know, 
even if you do have cursed dice, you can be like, in fact, you have to have cursed dice to do it. You can be like, I'm going to bleed one of my cursed dice to do what he just did, but I still take that complication. That's really cool. That seems really powerful. <laughs> it can be, but it's, it, there is a risk to it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a risk that it will hurt you to do that or hurt that someone sense. you love. That makes sense. Oh so, my gosh. But I, yeah. And I like that. It's not just that, like, you, ha- you do have to really think about it because it's not just you that it could affect. Yep. It could affect the others around you. So, yep. Which, geez, I'm just thinking about like what would happen if the character was like a sociopath of some sort and just not caring. <laughs> there, there are antagonist sorcerers who have stopped caring mm. and just cast all their spells that way. Oh, geez. That's yeah. horrible. It is horrible. <laughs> it's terrible. All right, so let's talk about what your damnation is. Oh boy, let's go. So you have a burning desire to use your magic in any situation. The more you use your magic, the more you want to keep using it. And anytime your curse die pool reaches zero, you lose control and you cast spells without restraint. The sorcerer must use magic to solve her problems, even if it is wildly overkill for the situation. That sounds like me. If I was ever actually granted magic, I would probably use it for every situation. Right. Even if it like, I need to park the car, use a magic to do that. How? I wouldn't just use the magic. Like you just gotta. You uh, gotta you perfectly could, align the car. Yeah. Um, the only way to regain control is to do this ritual sacrifice. So at this point, you must sacrifice, you must spend a scene sacrificing something that is meaningful to you. If if needing to go suddenly, you know, spill some blood in the woods, make things inconvenient for you or your crew members, then you'll you can gain an a curse die or a momentum. And the way this works is when you go to do that sacrifice, because it would normally give you a curse die, it gives you a curse die, which gives you control again, because now your pool is no longer at zero. If it is deeply inconvenient, then you get a curse die or a momentum, your choice. You can get a second curse die or a momentum. If the sacrifice is also one of your family's traditional sacrifices, you'll get both a momentum and a curse die. And that's oh. important because you could just sacrifice anything in the moment because we need to. But if you are able to take the time to sacrifice what it is your family normally sacrifices, then you'll you'll be able to get both. So that's your damnation. That is the that is the reason why you may choose to just fast cast something instead of bleeding your last curse die and take that risk. So you said it a few times. I just want to make sure I'm fully understanding. When you say bleed a cursed eye, that's just using it. It's, it's pulling it out of your dice pool, okay, and 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 pulling it away from available dice for your pool. Okay, Heard. specific Heard. specifically important because there are things that require you to have cursed dice in your pool at certain numbers to do the to do the spell. So if you're you know say you have three of them available to create dice pools with and something requires you to hold three, then you can cast that spell. But if you then bleed one, now you only have two left. Heard. And so you Makes can't sense. do anything that requires you to hold more than two. So that's that's why that distinction is important. Okay, perfect. Noted. So, and and, and, and that's why we didn't use the word, or the word used isn't, there because you are technically using them when you hold them you're just not expending them so uh, the the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, (laughs) torments sorry I was reading a a note torments are uh, kind of a way that you're you, you kind of act out because you're cursed. These are all narrative, like I said, role play burdens that will give you momentum. And there are every lineage has two that you get to choose from, and then you will pick a personal trigger that will like cause you to act out in this way. Okay. okay. 
So we'll, we'll go through the two that you have. Uh, the first is curiosity kills. Uh, at the core of their nature, sorcerers are curious. This constant thirst for knowledge and power separates them from average humans and drives them to pursue increasingly ambitious goals. A character with this torment cannot pass up an opportunity to gain information or power. When you give in to the torment, you must drop everything you were doing to pursue a lead on knowledge or power without heed for any other circumstances. Obtaining it still won't make you happy. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, that's that's kind of how, like, you know, I, it makes sense now with that title, Torments. <laughs> Yes. Uh, the second one is unchecked hubris. Uh, sorcerers may or may not have stolen their power, but however they claimed, they got away with it. As a whole, they've been riding this high of victory for centuries. A character with this torment thinks she can get away with anything. When she succumbs, she's driven to audacity, attempting things that she shouldn't. This can range from taunting incredibly powerful beings to trying to steal priceless artifacts in plain sight to trying to steal vast power from other accursed. The story guide is free to bribe the player with suggestions of terrible ideas that sound great right about now. Mm. So prompting a lot of devil's bargains. <laughs> yes. So which one do you think calls more to you? They're both really interesting and I have ideas of how I could play with both, but the one I like the most, honestly, is Curiosity, Curiosity Kills. Excellent. Um, but that's just because I, as a person, I also collect a lot of different books and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so I kind of understand that torment mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. And this is always you choose to give in to the torment. This is always a narrative choice on your part. Now we can talk about, so you can always just choose to give in to it. And then there are times when it might proc because you have this kind of personal trigger that kind of triggers it. And then you get to choose what that is. And that could be anything from, uh, you know, seeing knowledge destroyed to having somebody insult you to, um, you know, somebody getting your order wrong at a restaurant. Like it should be something that's going to come up, but isn't going to come up like every five minutes. That makes sense. Uh, oh, geez. <laughs> uh, I'm honestly not 100% sure what would be a good one in this instance, at least just right now. Um, well, you can, we can always kind of wait on it once we've kind of dig dug more into the character. Mm -hmm. um, so that's totally fine. So be thinking about it, though, as we, you know, build more of the character. So now we know what the sorcerer gets. Let's talk about your path. Uh, you have, you're going to get path skills, you're going to get attributes, and you're going to get a major path inheritance. Now, you get to choose one of your paths to be your major path, and it is going to give you an inheritance. You can either choose your lineage. I am, I think being a sorcerer is the most important part of my character's path and, and where they are today. Or you can choose your family. I think the family that I belong to and the sacrifices I make are the more important aspect of my character. Depending on which one you pick will also depend your how many skill dots and attribute dots you get. So I'm going to kind of leave the path skills and attributes for right now. And we're going to talk about the families. And once okay. you pick your family and we, you know, think about like, okay, what does that mean? Then you can pick which one is major and which one is minor. And then we'll fill in all the dots. Does that make sense? It does to me. Yeah. Okay. So like I said earlier, the families are kind of organized around what they sacrifice and how they view sacrifices. So well, let me go through all the, the families and then you tell me which one calls out to you the most. So we have the archivists are, they sacrifice knowledge, uh, secrets especially. And it's it's kind of a, 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 a shitty pile of 
dung that's rolling downhill and getting bigger and bigger because once you've sacrificed a piece of knowledge, you can't sacrifice that same piece of knowledge again because it is gone, literally. No one knows it. No one remembers it. Certainly not you. Uh, that's we, terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying. That's terrifying. So, which means you have to start collecting information to be able to have it to sacrifice. So they they keep secrets. They find secrets. They keep information, and they kind of think back on um, of what they're doing as collecting secrets that are maybe things that nobody should know. Um, I can never unsee this. <laughs> right kind of thing yes and they they can sacrifice a secret either by making it not a secret anymore i.e spilling it to everyone or they can sacrifice a secret by destroying it now no one knows it even the people who were keeping it originally so yeah they're a little they're a little shitty sometimes and they can be bitchy because if they learn your secret they may be like you know what? I'm going to sacrifice this secret by um, telling everyone. Bye. See you later. Uh. Oh <laughs> it's like the rumor mill at like its worst. It sure is. Uh, then we have the faceless. And the faceless are interesting because the thing that they sacrifice is a claim and recognition. So they they actively go and perform illegal acts and take zero credit for it, leave zero evidence of it. And as long as no one knows they did it, they have sacrificed the knowledge that they have done this thing. They have sacrificed the credit that they have done this thing. Interesting. Okay. Yes. It's going They're, very much into the concept of something. Yes, absolutely a concept. Um, the sacrifice is the risk that you're taking by doing the crime in the first place. Okay. Very fascinating. Yes. Um, which, you know, means that they, they do a lot of crime for people and they that's why they're called the faceless because people will hire them and those people who are hiring them can't even know who is doing it for them because if they do then that doesn't work as a sacrifice i can see like this sort of like family wearing like a lot of like masks or stuff that like obscure their physicality so they don't even yep. have like a presence yep it's very it's 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 kind of reminding me of like rorschach from the watchman and yeah. that his presence as rorschach is what everybody knows and his disguise is when he takes off the mask right exactly yes mm. so then we have the network and the network is a like a tried and true net pyramid scheme. They sacrifice their connections to other people. So the way that that works is, is they network with other people. They pull in people under them and they say, hey, you know, join the network and join us and also get your own connections under you. And I may cut you off at any moment to set to fuel my own magic. So sorry if I do. Ghosting at its weirdest. Yes. <laughs> yes. So they they cultivate relationships with people so that they have them to burn later. Okay. Uh, I can. I, man, they really don't have friends, then, do they? Not really. <laughs> I mean, it's risky to be friends with one. Yeah. <laughs> they try. They have very strict rules about not doing that to other accursed but you know there's always someone yeah i could imagine though like the one that they would keep like closest to themselves and the one that they would allow like i could imagine like especially like if years pass like if they do end up sacrificing that they would get so much more in return possibly yeah like biting time and letting it build up yep yeah possibly so uh, next we have the premiere. 
And the premier sacrifice, so they are one, they are a uh, a family of rich, extremely rich people. Um, and they sacrifice their time and effort. And it's it's weird. So they they tell people they they tell themselves probably that they collect fame, wealth, power, so that they can use it to sacrifice their time in the most efficient way possible. I can do pro bono work for people. I can feed an entire soup kitchen full of people with a bunch of money and time and effort. And that's not going to make me homeless tomorrow because of it. I sacrifice my time and energy and keep all the wealth for myself. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh my God. It's the rich kid in the, it's the rich kid in the for, uh, uh, sorority or fraternity. Yep. You and and the you know you can't imagine how hard it is to sacrifice anonymity, freedom, time, integrity, well-being, and our fondest memories just to keep power. Hmm. Because, yeah. So there is like it sounds at first kind of superficial, but then when you get into what are you actually sacrificing to be always known, constantly being followed, constantly like think of those like. Instagram, like life people who like constantly everything on their life is being live streamed, right? How much of like free time, personal space they're sacrificing all the time to just be known. Oh my God. I'm already, I was already like thinking about that with my streaming and why I had to like cut back a little bit because I wasn't getting my own time. <laughs> right. Yeah. They happen to be rich, but it, there is that element of and they're not like they're not so rich that they don't have to work, but they are they're well off in a sense that like their family takes care of them. So they do yes. kind of resort to materialism because it's the only thing they're not sacrificing. Oh my god. I see a lot of Nepo babies in these. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh we have the Reeves. Uh the Reeves are life sacrificers. They uh, they do it in a way that is most respectful to nature. That's what they really do is respect nature. But they consider it a support of nature by honoring the cycle of life and death and sacrificing the things that don't, that need to die and haven't yet. Oh, so you don't just feed and water your plants, you pull weeds, you clip back overgrowth, you cultivate helpful insects to destroy the bad ones. Under your There's, exact <laughs> I just had a really like <laughs> like I could see I could see this being taken to a very big extreme to like people who have been like alive too long or something along those lines to their per to their perspective. Yes. Like like members of government. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um for them life and death is both a worthy sacrifice. So uh they can sacrifice creatures or items, but they can also sacrifice death. If they save somebody's life and take that pain onto themselves, that is a sacrifice. Um you know, if they you know, do therapy work for people or work like suicide hotlines. They're oh. sacrificing their own mental well-being to keep somebody else alive. And that Man, that's works. actually sweet. Or they could go in the, you know, woods and kill the somebody. <laughs> yeah. the, either one works. Dang. I didn't think about it that way. That's, that's. Yeah. That's fascinating. I'm going to make a note. <laughs> yeah. I'll play this again. <laughs> And then we finally have uh, the unburdened. The unburdened are 
they are people who have decided that they will sacrifice their all of their worldly possessions. So they're not a family, they're a movement and a system of ideas. Um, they don't have a hierarchy. They decided to say, fuck society. They have literally decided to live lives as aesthetics uh, to, you know, essentially every time they get a thing, they sacrifice it. They don't keep or hold worldly goods. And when if they do have a, a worldly thing, they share whatever they have with everyone else in their family. I really like that. That's that's really interesting. Um, I because I'm also looking at the at the notes as we are as we're reading this. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely think I'm going to go with this one, the unburdened. If mm -hmm. I'm being honest, um, not only because like it speaks to me on a personal level, I like the like commune kind of style that they have situated with that um but i also feel like as a representative of the rolling nomads yeah it totally that works fits. <laughs> yep so yeah i think i'm definitely gonna go with the unburdened on this yeah one. and and you know here's a thing of like uh they their magic is the they they kind of recognize that the world is fucked up and that they can't do a whole lot about it so they're just kind of making their own thing um you know one of the lines in here is we understand what it means to be neighborly when the whole world has lost its fucking mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's no solving the problems, only fixing what we can. They're not trying to solve the world's problems. They're just trying to live their life on their own terms. Uh, and so they're just, you know, they make a thing together and then that's a worldly good. And so they just sacrifice it and move on. It's kind of so, funny because with the connection of being the unburdened mixing with my um, given lineage of sorcerer, I actually have a character that I used to play in this uh, play by post role play that I haven't been able to play in so long. And I kind of miss her. So I might bring her back for this. Then. Mm -hmm. Um she was kind of person who was uh, a traveling artist. She lived only in a van, uh, had um, all of just just basically what she needed, and she traveled around and uh, kind of just um, spread her art and spread uh, uh, her, I guess, ideals in a way in that mm -hmm. situation, and just kind of existing in the moment. Yeah. Um, and she also was uh a mage type character um who enchanted pokemon cards to have different uh effects so i love that and, and it kind of it's kind of interesting because like she used them as often as she wanted for instance she was drinking tea that was too hot so she pulled out um she pulled out uh an articuno card that she had enchanted to be be basically like an ice pack so she would channel her mana into that and then place and then place it on against the cup and it was cooler <laughs> so any instance so i think i think i'm going to try to adapt that character into this because i think it fits the most for me yeah okay great um then so the biggest question right now is do you feel like the aspect of being an unburdened and this kind of nomadic uh, sacrifice what you get, share what you have lifestyle is what she identifies most with? Or do you feel like the fact that she is a sorcerer and she can use her magic to do these things, the thing that she identifies most with? Ooh, that's a big question. That's a big question. I honestly want to say, because like it, it could go either way depending, um, but... I feel like this is almost a flip the coin scenario because she could be pretty 50 50 with that. Um, let's go with, uh, let's go with the unburdened as being okay. her major one. Okay. That sounds good. So let's go back to the lineage path and fill in your skills and attributes from that. And then we'll go 
back to families and fill in your path from that. So your path skills from your lineage, from being a sorcerer, are artistry, esoterica, and science. Artistry, esoterica, and science. And you're going to have four dots to distribute among those three however you like. Uh, with this character sheet, how is that? Um, oh, artistry. Okay, I see. So I could just put the number there. Where does it say um, on the on the uh, the ba the book that you gave me for that? Mm -hmm. uh, what page is that on? Uh, it is page nine of the sorcerer booklet. Page nine. That that shows which skills and attributes you're going to get. Thank you. And what'd you say the uh, the spread was? Four. Oh, you get four dots. Four, four dots artistry, put... artistry, esoterica, and science. I'm going to put uh, two in artistry. That makes total sense. Uh, one in the esoteric. Do, 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 does each have to have one or can I just give mm -hmm. up on one? No, you can just give up on one. I'm going to put two in artistry and two in esoterica. Perfect. Uh, and then you're going to get all of your attributes are going to start at one. And then you're going to have uh, two dots to put into mental attributes. So any of the three mentals. Uh, one to put in a physical and one to put in a social. Okay. Uh, so two dots to add into mental. Let me see. Honestly, I feel like they would be... I want to put them into... I want to put, uh, put one into intellect and the other into resolve. Okay. Uh, and then... One into physical. Physical. Let's go with dexterity, increasing that to two. Okay. And then and one in social. Yes. Let's go with presence. Cool. All okay. right. Now for your family path, you're going to get, for your skills, you're going to get medicine, survival, and technology. And those are going to be, you're going to get six dots to put across all three of those and all of them have to have at least one dot. All of them have to have at least one dot. Yes. So, and, and the one dot counts against the six, right? Yes. Yes. And that was medicine. Survival and technology. Survival and tech. All right. Uh, so that leaves me with three dots remaining to do with. Let me see. I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put one more into medicine and I'm going to put, um, Honestly, I feel like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bump survival to three because I feel sure. like that, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of lifestyle requires some basic sense of survival, yep. uh, if not even more. You know. <laughs> yep, that would make total sense. Yeah, so you're gonna get three dots to put into your mental attributes. All right. Let's go ahead and. In, in this sense, can you describe resolve to me? Resolve is like your, like, it's your mental, like, wherewithal if something is overwhelming to you, if something is confusing, if somebody is kind of like, if you're trying to, you know, puzzle something out, resolve is kind of that. It's also kind of your resolution to, like, stand strong to your ideals and to you oh, know yeah. not give in to to temptation and things like that right. perfect you said there's three for mental that i'm adding right yes okay so i'm just going to go ahead and put two more into resolve bring that up to a solid four 
And then uh, intellect boosting that to three. Okay. All right, so that's mental. All right, and then you're gonna get four physical. Four physical, I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna do two into two more into dexterity, bring that to four, and I'm gonna add two into stamina, bringing that to three. Okay, and you're gonna get three to put in a social. Social, let me see. Uh, two more into presence, bringing that to four, and composure, and bring that to two. All right, so you get a major, so this is your major path, so this is your major path inheritance. You pass through the world unattached to society's trappings. Witnesses forget about you when recalling a scene and people overlook you. If you do something to draw attention to yourself, you may bleed a cursed eye to have witnesses describe incorrect details about it. Bam, just happens. If, if there is a supernatural witness, they can attempt to uh, do a clash. You'll use your survival. They'll use their enigmas to ignore uh, to ignore that. Uh, but you get a plus one enhancement on your clash, so you're more likely to succeed than they are. A clash is just a, a versus opposed action that happens whenever two supernatural things run across each other. So, cool. so essentially, it, mortal mortals will just you can be like. Uh, I did something to draw attention to myself and I don't want to have been noticed. I'm just going to bleed that cursed eye and people are just going to describe a dude instead of a woman, right? Like, or a, like a really, really, really tall Amazonian woman with a sword. And you're like, I am the smallest itty bittiest little girl. No one will like discern that this is wrong. It'll be indescribably incorrect details about you. Unless they're really supernatural. Because this character is usually about, uh, described usually about five foot flat. Nice. Yes. <laughs> so, so it's like you're just fronting. and Everybody thinks this weird, like crazy tall woman is running around doing awful things. Not awful things, just things that draw attention. Uh, and you're not, it's, it's you're like, oh, it's no, not me. Cool. <clears throat> so now we have... Uh, the last thing that your family gives you, which is a motif. Uh, I don't have names for these. Apparently, I need names for them because people need to have something to put on their character sheet, which does make sense. Mm -hmm. So each of these is a thing that uh, essentially they are ways that modify your spells that kind of help make your family a little different from everybody else who can maybe cast the same spells. So um, I'm going to tell you what your options are. You get one of these. Okay. So when casting spells with the psychic attunement, you may bleed an additional cursed die to declare that an object you need or that would be advantageous to you uh, in an investigation is in the scene, or it's actually it's advantageous to you in in any way is, is in the scene. So you can essentially say, you can bleed a cursed eye to narratively declare something is in the scene with you anytime you cast a spell with a psychic attunement. Okay. Um that one may need to be reworked. We'll we'll table that one. Uh when casting spells with the emotional attunement, you may bleed an additional cursed die to add an additional target. And then when casting spells with the ephemeral attunement, you may bleed or hold one less cursed die to a minimum of zero, which is really good. Especially for, I have to cast spells no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. Uh... What page was this on again? Uh, so this sorry. is on... No, it's okay. It's under the Unburdened, and that looks like it's page on 24 of 26. And it's like halfway down the page. It's motifs. Got it, got it, got it. Oh, you said one of them was psychic? Uh, yeah. The ones I see on motifs for the Unburdened. Yeah, I... It, it The investigation thing doesn't exist. It should be psychic. Okay. Okay, let me just make a note really quick on my copy. Mm -hmm. Hey, oh, no, sir. 
do not. I know it is dinner time, but you can go bother dad for dinner. Text him. Okay. So I pick one of these? Yep. Let's go with the emotional. Okay. I feel. Sounds good. All right. So now we will come back to practices in a minute, but go ahead and note down that you get access to the practices of biomancy, illusion, and telelocation. Where do I note these on the character sheet? Uh, there should be like a place for practices or spells. Oh, spells. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it was biomancy, illusion, and tech telelocation. Yes. And telelocation. And just for the viewers, this is the only lineage that has this. Almost uh, every other lineage has three practices that they just get. Um, the sorcerers just know a lot more magic practices. And so each family specializes in three practices, but the sorcerers actually have like seven different practices among them. <laughs> yeah. And because you Extra. can cast anything that you've seen. Yay. All right. So now we are going to switch back to the character creation document. So this is where we're going to move back to character creation out of the sorcerer document. Uh, and we're going to go to step four, which is choose a role path. And the role path is your character's profession. It's what you do. It's what you do in life. It is kind of your mundane kind of way of interacting with the world. Okay. Um, so there's a list here of roles. Um, honestly, I could. there's a couple in this list that I think could fit for this character, but I'll let you kind of look them over and, and see if there's one that pulls out to you. Uh, let me see. Sorry, this is, this is me reading. So if you want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's okay. So there's academic, which is kind of like your university student or professor or something like that. There's activist, which is a person who like goes out on picket lines or helps people like do you know, lobbies for change, like good change, positive change, things like that. There's caregiver, which, you know, somebody who takes care of someone else, either as their job or because that's just the circumstances of their life. Like I have to take care of my mom. She's super sick. She lives with me, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, creative. So like that's your artists and your poets and stuff like that. Criminal, self-explanatory. Enforcer, that's like your, your cop or your bouncer or your literally anybody who is enforcing other people's rules, executive. So your businessy person fighter. So this is your, you know, military person or your boxer, things like that healer. So doctor, um, natural herbalist, you know, acupuncture, you could even be like massage therapist at that point. Uh, hunter is kind of geared towards I, I know there's super other supernatural shit out there that shouldn't exist and I'm going to hunt it. Um, influencer. So just like that sounds like uh, you, you influence other people to action investigator. Uh, so, you know, a detective or somebody who's an internet sleuth, that kind of thing, a cultist. So you look into esoteric bullshit and student, which is about being not in college or in a higher level of academic, but more in the like teenage role or a young college student. Okay. There are two that are calling out to me on this. Um, obviously the creative is one of them, mm -hmm. uh, but also based on how I played that character before and how I can like adapt it, mixing with how the sorcerer's side is this, I can also see a cultist. Um, I was, yep. 
I was thinking of those two for you also. So, I mean, <laughs> honestly, you know, you can maybe just do the thing where you're like, what, what skills do I get? Um, creative has culture that you don't currently have on your skill list yet. And a cultist has athletics that you don't have on your skill list yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, let's see. Creative gets, they get the same uh, mental, physical, social spread too. So man, it's really just kind of what you want for your concept at that point. I feel that. Um, I feel like I could be a, like a traveling, a traveling fortune teller. I love uh, that. In this one. So yeah, let's go with that. Cause that seems, that seems fun. Plus I actually have tarot cards. I can use Yay. that. Um, cool, cool, cool. So yeah, cool. We'll go with, uh, uh, so you're going to have athletics, esoterica and medicine as your path skills and you're going to have again four dots to distribute and you you don't have to put one in every single one of them so you can kind of put them however you like cool i'm going to go ahead i don't see medicine being super big for me unless it's going to be important but let me go ahead and put i'm going to put at least two more in esoterica and bring bring that up to four dots uh and then let's go ahead you know what I'll, I'll put one more in medicine to bring it to three and another and, and one in athletics that at least have something in that sure so yeah i think i like that spread okay and then you get two dots to put into mental let's see uh what's a max what's the max dots for this? five, five? yeah five okay uh we're gonna bring resolve to five all right <laughs> You said there's three I have to, have to work with for this? Two. 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 Um, and screw it. Inflect the four. Cool. Uh, who, who cares about cunning? Uh, physic, <laughs> you have one physical dot. I am not a cunning person, I don't think. So <laughs> it's hard for me to role play that. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Uh, you get uh, one physical dot. One physical dot. Um, we're just going to bring dexterity up to five. Cool. And you have one social. One social. Uh, composure, bring that up to three. Cool. All right. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to finalize your statistics. So this is going to be where you get um, some extra skill dots and, and uh, your contacts. So the extra skill dots, you're going to get four dots. They can go into any skill. They don't have to be your path skills. So this is how you can kind of like round out, oh, I kind of maybe wanted a little bit of, I wanted a close combat or I wanted to be able to at least shoot a gun or I wanted, you know, to be able to drive a car, but none of my things gave me that. I can, you have these four dots to kind of play around with. Heard, heard, heard. It's funny that you mentioned guns. <laughs> because... mm. <laughs> now I'm just thinking of my my character wanting to like enchant the bullet or something like that. <laughs> uh, hmm. oh, puppy. <laughs> yes, they're being they're playing. Oh, they're, they're being cute because it's dinner time, and of, of course, course, Klaus just shut the door on him. And then they're going to come and come to me like, this is a problem we can't solve. Cool. Okay. I'm going to uh, put three yeah, and I can, and I, and I can add those to skills that I already had too, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to put, th you said four? Uh, four dots. Yes. Uh, three are going to go into ranged combat. And then I'm going to bring esoteric up to five. That's excellent. Um, and then you're going to get contacts and the way contacts work is they are people that, you know, who can do things for you that come from your paths. So you're going to get one contact per path that you have. So somebody who's, uh, who, you know, because you're a sorcerer, so it doesn't have to be another sorcerer. It could be literally, it could be a person that, you know, like it be, it could be a local mortal witch that, you know, whatever. Um, someone that you know because you're an unburdened, so someone else in the family or somebody that you've helped, something like that. 
and then someone that you know because you're creative. So maybe, or sorry, an occultist. occultist. Yeah, an occultist. So maybe another, uh, you know, maybe a cult bookstore owner or a. I was just thinking about that actually. Right. Yeah. Um, so these are, so you'll define those three and then you're going to assign five dots among them. Um, each one gets one dot. So you're going to essentially have two dots to kind of, to move, to, to build some of them up a little bit. Right. So it's okay. five dots, one, two, three, and then those two do other dots are going to go elsewhere. It, you know, on one or all, all on one or on, among two. The way that the dots work is every dot you put into a contact gives it a tag. The tags are the areas that it's good in. Anytime you ask it to go do anything for you, it goes and does it. If it needs to roll for that thing, it rolls with eight dice. Okay. If it is if it is good at that thing, however many dots it has gives it enhancement on the roll. Okay. Um, and on the character sheet, these go on connections. Uh, yeah, they're yeah contacts connections. Um, and the the tags are things like archive, somebody who has access to ancient or esoteric lore, so that occult bookstore owner probably an archive. Dangerous, somebody who's prone to violence. Fence, somebody who has access to. An underground market or something influential can get you into places informant can give you information investigator can help you find evidence a mentor can give you story guide information moneyed can get you a loan on a large sum of money security can provide sanctuary and sneaky can get in and out of places and get you in and out of places which you can already do on your own but they can go and do something sneaky so okay Trying to think of what I uh, what one I want for my sorcerer's one. So I have for the for the occult one bo uh, called bookstore owner that I know. Um, for the family one, I feel like there's always going to be like I, you you mentioned it just now. I feel like there's always going to be like a mentor of sorts, especially in a sure. situation like this that you look up to. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mentor within the family is going to be my connection for that one. Uh, can you give me an example one more time of like the sorcerer's one? It could be it could be another sorcerer from another family that you are friends with. It could be uh, someone who you uh, are friends with because you're a sorcerer, somebody who like, hey, I know you're a sorcerer and you can do things for me. And so we're, we have like this kind of quid pro quo with each other kind of thing. It, I like it, that one. Let's okay. go with that one. Let's go with having a friend that just likes me for my magic. <laughs> sure, sure. It gives me an excuse to use it. I and I I think that person is a would be hilarious if they were like super influential. So you kind of use them for their influence and they use you for your magic. Okay. All right. So that's that. And you said I have two dots to play with. Kinda, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh I'm gonna put one into the occult store owner. So mm -hmm. that brings it up to two. Uh and then I think I'm going to keep the influential friend at one just because of the fact that like there's still that kind of like that as you said that quid pro quo kind of mm -hmm, between us mm -hmm, to where it's mm -hmm. not like close enough I feel like I would have a deeper bond with my mentor sure so let's go ahead and bring that up to two so I have uh the influential friend at one family mentor at two and the bookstore owner at two okay cool great so anybody at two they're going to have two tags because you get a tag for every dot you have so, um, so your mentor can get a second tag and so can your archive. So do you have any concept of what else you would want to put on them? I could see your mentor also having like a security where they can like have a safe place for you, give you sanctuary, things like that when you need it. I like that. Let's go with that. And then your, oh man you know, it'd be hilarious. And this is, mm. you don't have to take it is if your bookstore owner is also a fence. <laughs> you know, you, you gotta know all these people, right? Yeah, you, you, right. You gotta, you gotta have possibilities, especially. When, like... <laughs> Sorry, hold on. It's okay. Take your time. I'm, I'm going to take it. Cause I like that.
hope everybody is having a good time uh, with this. I sure am. Huh. Yeah, no, that's one. That's one. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go with the fence because that is really funny. That is really funny. <laughs> Plus, you know, sometimes I get my, I, my, I might get my hands on some stuff that, uh, that I need to like pass along, you know. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I did that. Yep. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I do it all that. the time. It's okay. Yeah. I was like, oh, dogs are barking. Let me mute it. There was, oh, there was one stream where I was accidentally muted for like thirty minutes. <laughs> amazing i love that for you <laughs> i i do that kind of stuff all the time it's it's so embarrassing all right now we're going to step six which is to gain oh let me really quickly the other things you do would note down your defense which is always one you roll your stamina whenever you get attacked to set your defense for the round your integrity is also always one anytime a social action is being made against you you roll either your resolve or composure depending on what the influence is um and then you have seven injuries okay so uh... Okay, I see. Yeah. And then you start with entanglement one. Entanglement is like your power stat. It de it defines how many cursed dice you can hold. And it also kind of like some spells, uh, some of the spell, like what you can learn and how much of it you can learn um, it is dependent on your entanglement level. Okay. So, but it starts at one. Uh then now we're going to go to step six, which is gains edges and spells. So edges, you have five dots of edges. The edges are just underneath that those couple of paragraphs. There are uh, they're mostly undane, mundane. They're kind of like merits. They're you know special like abilities that are always on. They're not spells. They generally don't cost anything, and they usually add like a a new mechanic or a way to break the rules or some uh, enhancement on a thing. There are mostly mundane, but there are a couple of supernatural edges. The supernatural edges, most of them ha are lineage specific, except for a couple. And uh, so you should look at for the sorcerers, your options are flexible spellcasting, which is uh, when you choose this gift, you choose one spell attunement, either emotional, psychic, physical, or ethereal, and then you can apply this attunement to all of your spells, regardless of if it makes sense. Uh, this would be good for you since you took that emotional motif. Every spell you cast would be considered emotional. I like that. How many dots do you say we five? Uh, five, yes. Yeah, let's do flexible uh, spell casting as one. And them. right, and just I know you're gonna you pick that, but I just want to tell you what your other one would be is thief of lore. Uh, you know where your family keeps all its old tomes, and you're adept at finding new magic. Sometimes that means learning from someone you know, and other times that means stealing the information. Choose a single source or practice that your family does not normally have access to, and gain access to it as though it were one of your own, which would allow you to learn spells from it. Um, so that okay. would be the the other option for sorcerers. Let's see. But there's also a bunch of like influence and investigation and action edges that you may be interested in. So This is where, sorry, this is where like my reading like comes nope, into, it, comes into it's, play. Yeah, literally everyone, this is the, the pause moment, like the hardest part where they're like, oh no, there's so many good options. Yeah, there really is. There really is. Oh, hold on. Yes. <laughs> okay.
Okay, with me having my ranged combat at three, I'm tempted to take Ricochet. <laughs> ricochet is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to do that just because of the fact that, like, I could also play that into a little bit of, like, uh, using my magic with, uh, with how I shoot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's go with Ricochet. Perfect. That's five. Yeah. Uh, and just for the viewers, uh, after you fail, if you fail a ranged combat attack, you can spend a momentum to instead choose a different target to apply the attack's hits to and gain an enhancement. So if you had rolled zero hits, you still get to apply that and get an enhancement that it will, uh, it will apply. Uh, the player may choose to instead re-roll the attack, but it still must be against a new target. If that attack misses, you can't use Ricochet again in, into another target. Okay. Um, it can't be infinitely looped. No, much. no. Uh, you can also just have it target an inanimate object, which does not require a, um, a like, it's an, at that point, like a difficulty zero um, to have it just shoot, like shoot, shoot open a lock or shatter a video camera and be like, ah, I meant to miss you and it hit something else important and good in, for me instead. I love it. I also feel like they're going to be played off as like somebody having like insane luck. Value. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Uh, and you have one more dot. That, no, no, you don't. You have five dots. You have spent them. Perfect. Wonderful. <clears throat> then the next thing you get are spells. Spells are, uh, <sighs> you're going to get three spells. You're going to get them from your, uh, your family's practices, which are biomancy, illusion, and telelocation. Um, I sent you the, the newest document I sent you. I just pulled, uh, those so those should be the only three that you see? Yes. Okay. So the, there's five spells in each. And you can choose your three from any of the practices. And it doesn't all have to come from the same practice. So it's essentially pick three from these 15 in front of you. Heard, heard, heard. Okay. Time for some reading again. Not as much, but let me try. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh my god see and hear through plant life yes. that is powerful <laughs> well unless you're in like the concrete jungle <laughs> I mean a potted plant works oh that's true that's true that's true <laughs> that's how i communicate with my friends i just tell them to all have <laughs> plants in their place just listen in on everybody <laughs> oh my god i could just picture a character just being like uh whenever they make a new friend they just gift them a plant uh, here. yes here you, go. <laughs> here you go don't think about it don't just make sure you keep it. up just with it <laughs> don't think about it don't let it die mm-hmm The Reeves also get biomancy, and I imagine that that is a much more sinister version of that. Oh, yeah. Like, don't let it die, or I will come and kill you, and I will know because I can see through its eyes. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so Hammer Space. Yes. Um, is that a pocket that I can access whenever. Yes. So uh, the way that that works is when you cast it, um, you you put you can put a thing into it. Mm -hmm. You just kind of throw something into the void. Um, and then you may cast it again to pull something out of the void. I feel like Mary Poppins's bag has hammer space. <laughs> yes, pretty much. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. I already know what I'm gonna want. Hammer space is one of them. That makes total sense for your character. I 
I'm not gonna lie. I like. I, I, I think she's gonna be a telelocation baddie. I mean, that's <laughs> fine. Um, like honestly, every time we do this, somebody's like, either they really like one practice, which is totally okay, or they're like, like it's so hard to decide because I like all of these. It is, but I'm also like thinking about like there, there's only one other one that's kind of like pricking at me, and that's pre- uh, uh, pre- uh, prestige. Uh-huh. Just because, like, be- the ability to like see through um, magical illusions is uh, uh, something that's pretty cool too. Yep. Um, what's the limit of portal? So at your, at, at entanglement one, it has to be something that you can, a a location you can see. Okay. So basically I would just make a portal where I am and the exit point would appear uh, within that one that I can see. Right. And it can be out to extreme range as long as you don't have anything obstructing your view, but it has to be something that you can see. Yeah. Okay. And I assume, uh, teleport it says uh just a location that i know yes okay there is she would know teleport just so that she could get back to her family whenever yeah there is a a a little bit of limitation on teleport um right now but it's probably it's one of those things that i'm gonna have to think about um what makes the most sense for the limitations on it of how far when i was uh doing scion titan uh, Titan, Titanomachy. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, my character uh, had the ability to blink, where like <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it was called step sideways or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was all she ever did. Most of her movement was doing was just doing that. Yes, because you just boop, 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 <laughs> across the field. Yeah, absolutely. When we were when we were meeting, having our characters meet for the first time, we're not for, for for the first time getting back together. Um, she was just blinking all over the place, hugging everybody. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, portal is also fun because inanimate objects can go through it. So you could like create a portal to just like, oh, there's a moving car, and just be like a portal. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I think I'm gonna do like literally hammer space uh, and um... <sighs> hard. I know. There's only three. <laughs> I know. Uh, it is. It is very rough. It's a little easier for me to choose as well, just because of the fact that you said that I can do pretty much any spell that I've seen in that scene. Too. Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, but you don't know what other people, like, you don't know what you'll wind up seeing in a scene, though. That's true. Right? That's true. But it still opens up the possibility. Yes. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> there is a chance. Yes, I am. Yes, I am saying that there's a chance. And you're going to be hanging out with four other people. So they're going to be cast in stuff, too, probably. Yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to do telekinesis and teleport. All right. Have that good old telekinesis um so just quickly gonna read out uh your spells so that you know exactly what they do um hammer space is you must be holding two cursed dice to cast it Mm -hmm. so you don't bleed anything to do it you just as long as you have two cursed dice you can activate it you choose a non-living object within short range so it doesn't have to be something you're holding and teleport it into an extra dimensional space this item will remain in that space indefinitely. Alternatively, when you activate this spell, you can pull an item out of your extra dimensional space and have it appear anywhere within short range of you, including somewhere on your body, such as a pocket or in your hand. That's really handy. Also, that makes stealing things so much easier. <laughs> it does. Um, of course, if that comes into conflict with somebody who's magically holding onto something, then, you know, like if you're trying to steal something from somebody's telekinesis, that will do a clash just to warn you. Uh, telekinesis is you can pick up and move an object through space for the rest of the scene. Uh, if the object is held by another character, then you have to essentially make an attack against their defense, but you can use esoterica or ranged combat. Um, you can do gross movements, move the item wherever you like. You can't do fine. You can't like turn a key in a lock or pick a lock or something like that. 
Uh, you can make attacks out to long range using the item and it gains the light weapon tag along with any other tags it has if it is already a weapon. And you can purchase close combat tricks on those attacks. Mm, okay. In okay. Instead of being only reserved to ranged combat tricks. Then for teleport, uh, right now the limitation is that it it is a location that's known to you and the area is like a one mile radius or the size of a neighborhood, whichever is larger. Okay. So no smaller than a one mile radius. If the character has never been to the location before, you can you make an action, an esoteric action against difficulty zero with a moderate complication. So it's literally just a, you have a complication of, of doing this action. You're going to do it. You just need to see if you can buy off the complication, which is moderate. If you buy it, if you fail to buy it off, you arrive at your location stunned. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now that makes sense. Perfect. And that one bleeds a cursed die. Okay. Uh, telekinesis also bleeds a cursed die because you got that thing for the whole scene. Oh, right. You did say whole scene. Yeah. That's, that's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why it bleeds a cursed die. Perfect. Perfect. Hell yeah. All right. Then the last couple of things that we would be doing are choosing, uh, we're going to make character bonds together uh, with the rest of the group during the actual play. So we don't need to worry about that step. And then the last thing would be to assign your character's aspirations we get two short-term aspirations and one long-term aspiration. And these are the things that you want to see happen in the game session. Um, they're kind of indicators to me of the kinds of scenes you want to see. They can be super mundane. Like the examples are get the landlord off my back for another month or identify the driver who ran down my sister and sped away for long-term. The okay. short-term is, you know, get the landlord off my back for another month. I mean, it could be something that you want to do, not necessarily uh, a defensive, oh, I'll never, you know, I never want to have to do this again. Instead, it's, I want to go out and do X thing. You don't need to decide on those right now. If you don't have them in mind, we can make them, uh, you can think about them until we do our stream uh, recording and you can decide on them then. It may be worthwhile to decide on them with the group. Yeah. Uh, those are always ones that usually take me a little, a little second. And yeah, um, you got plenty of time to think about yeah. it between now and then. So perfect, that's, I, I've told everybody, that's not a thing I'm asking people to, to say right out now, think about it and, you know, also hear what other people's aspirations are when we get to the recording and then, you know, make your decisions. So perfect. also as a note, this character's name is Abigail. Abigail. Oh man, I don't even know if I know the names <laughs> of the other characters because I don't think anybody named their characters except for maybe the first character maybe got a name. And I, I now I don't remember because it's been so long. Fun fact, this character's name was Rachel. <laughs> but that's my now chosen name. No. Oh. So well, I think it's a little silly for me to name to name your character Rachel, which is yeah. now your name. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just uh, yeah. I, I I decided to retroactively rename her to Abigail. So Abigail. Kind of like, yeah. Do uh, do people call her Abby? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Don't have a last name, but surnames are like the thing that are like really hard for me. <laughs> That's fair. Me too. Man, first names are hard for me too. Like I am just, boop. it's the, the literal worst. So real. I'm, I'm so bad at naming things. I just, Oh my God. I use fantasy name generator a lot I of the use... time and kind of pick and choose. If, if like, I try to name things like NPCs and characters before I run a game for people, because if, mm -hmm. Players put me on the spot and be like, oh, what's that person's name? I'm just going to be like, his name is Bob. Her name is Bob. Everybody's name is Bob. <laughs> I can't think of a name. God, it's kind of funny because I actually did have a friend in high school that went by Bob for that Amazing. specific reason. They didn't yep. like their normal name. They couldn't think of something else. They just said, call me Bob. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. love that. 
So good. All right. And that's it. Abigail is done. Hell yeah. We're as done as she's going to be until, until our actual play. So we're wham, bam. And it's been what? An hour and 20, Three. 25 minutes. Yeah, Cause so we didn't start. Like yeah. So I told you super fast. Yeah. This was really fun. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this. Um, yeah. Really looking forward to uh, playing this soon. Me too. I'm excited to run for y'all. This group of people, like the group of characters that y'all have made has, I'm just so excited for, for your characters to meet each other. <laughs> I'm excited too. I like this is this is I don't normally do something like this. So like I usually do like group character creation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um it's it's fascinating doing this quote unquote blind without knowing what everybody else is playing yet. So that's gonna be that's gonna be fascinating to see. I'm very, I'm very excited to see what everybody else has made. I, I yeah, and normally I would encourage group character creation, but we thought that this would be kind of a fun way to do it so everybody's kind of making especially because everybody's making a different lineage so you've got your own lineage rules and you know hearing them doesn't confuse the other players who don't have the same lineage rules mm -hmm. so you get very like sp specific you know i'm sorry my light started flashing <laughs> what's happening <laughs> Yes, hey, that my, you <laughs> my closet door sometimes likes to close itself and it's not on a slant oh, and oh. um it, that's yeah. not creepy at all not at all <laughs> no all trust right. me i've had i've had some really weird stuff to where um i've had some of my friends be like D is your place haunted <laughs> i am pretty sure i'm cursed at this point i i opened the cursed manuscript i read the cursed manuscript and now i have made characters for every single lineage within <laughs> the cursed manuscript so this is literally just the culmination of the curse oh yeah. yeah it's getting meta it is <laughs> i love it i love it but yeah um so is there anything else that we should that you wanted to, to discuss about this before no other than to you know let your viewers know that we we're going to be recording the this is an actual play and that actual play will be View, streamed a lot like for the first time i guess previewed or debuted debuted mm -hmm. uh at onyx PathCon, uh pretty much right after opening ceremonies that's really exciting and then and then throughout the weekend if you miss that so we have it on the schedule multiple times so perfect perfect well yeah thank you so very much for uh joining us here on the rolling nomads yeah. Uh, do you want to uh, give yourself a little bit of an outro before? Sure. Um, you know, I'm D. I'm at Onyx Path. Uh, if you want to chat with me, you can do so on the Onyx Path Discord. If you want to support me, you could go check out the At the Gates backer kit that's going on right now, which is the game that I pitched to Rich and created. It's kind of a Japanese video game inspired high fantasy game. Um it's it's doing pretty well right now, but we're in the like the messy middle, as it were, of uh, being being. Sl it's the slump. It's the middle. It's somebody described it as a swimming pool. It's high on the sides and and, and low in the middle. <laughs> Looks like That's a swimming a pool. Yeah. So mood. so you know, in a week or two, it'll start popping again. But right now, it's just slowly trickling. People are backing and checking it out. But if you want to check it out, um. You can back, and if we hit 900 backers, we unlock the cutest little chibi versions of the characters I've ever seen as pens. Like, they're so cute. Do you actually have a, a link? I do. Can... <laughs> of course I do. Yeah, if you want to pop that link in the chat, yeah. um, you're more than welcome to. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let's grab it because that's my that's my big promotion right now. I mean, yes, I'm... I'm also, you know, let me, let me, I left the chat. Oh, the link is already posted. It looks oh, like. Travis, it's Travis. Thank <laughs> you, Travis. <laughs> also, hello, Travis. Thank you for hanging out. <laughs> yeah, we're at 888 backers, which is a serendipitous number. So if you want to be number 889 or 890, then please go back. Hmm. I may, I may have to, may have to go check that out right after yeah. we get go, off screen here. Go look, and if you are interested, like even if you're just like, oh, those pens are really cute. I don't really care about this game. Totally okay. Uh, you can back it like five dollars. Perfect. 
Heck yeah. Also, okay. I want you to know that your dog jump scared me a little bit because their head kind of poked out. Oh the no. There for a second. I'm like, oh. What is that? <laughs> <That's a problem. laughs> yeah. When I shut the door, they're like, mom, we can't come in. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, and of course, I've been uh, Rachel, also known as the Azure, Bu Azure Butterfly, or simply Azure. Uh, I used to stream on my own channel, but I haven't in a long time. Uh, but I do have my own YouTube that I'm working on uh, that you can find at the Azure Butterfly over on YouTube. Um, and I have some exciting things coming, including uh, a new Patreon for my writing and a couple of other things that you'll be hearing soon. Um, and of course, I have my Azure Storytelling Studio, or ASS for short, happening on uh, Thursday. So tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we're going to be going through <laughs> Fallout 4. And uh, acid it up. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I saw you losing it. Everybody, everybody loves the name. It's been it's you know been, you been told me you told me that name like way earlier, and it just did not clock <laughs> that it spelled ass, yeah. like not at all. <laughs> that was done on purpose. Um, so basically, what the storytelling studio is is we play games that I enjoy that have. A lot of story aspects being either direct story or environmental storytelling. And I like going into the details of what stands out to me, what I think works, ah, what I think doesn't work and the like. And makes, we just have a good time. That makes um, total sense. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, that's happening at, uh, at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 2 p.m mountain standard time <laughs> yeah and if you're interested in at the gates if you're watching this which i don't know how many people are actually watching this um there is i know that awkward corbin gm is running a awkward gm corbin man i'm awkward about it uh <laughs> is running a uh play test of at the gates uh actual play of the uh ash can adventure um in like 20 minutes on the onyx path twitch so you can go okay. check it out there. Perfect. Uh, but yeah, um, and of course, uh, we as a group here are the Rolling Nomads. You can find uh, information about us on our website at rollingnomads.card.co.co. There we go. Okay. Um, and we also have our Twitter where you can find all of our going live announcements, late starts and new content coming to uh, the channel at underscore rolling nomads. Um, if you have any uh, uh, things that you like to clip from any of our shows, feel free to do so. You may see them appear at our TikTok at underscore rolling nomads as well. Uh, we also have our YouTube where we post up all of our uh, previous recordings. Uh, that's at Rolling Nomads over on YouTube as well. And that's us in a handbasket. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you so very much for being here and doing this with us, Dee. Of course, um, yes. It was lots of fun. Yeah. And we'll catch you next time. Have a All good right. one, everybody.